feet that I uh, continually use myself with blocks freestanding. These blocks are nothing but mere patio blocks that were originally two inches thick, eight inches wide, 16 inches long that were split in half, which then in turn makes them two by four by 16. We've had these blocks tested under laboratory conditions in the polymer section of the B.F. Goodrich Company. It was impossible to test the tensile strength that it would take or pounds per square inch on an upright position, but on a supported position, the same amount of blocks would take over 6,000 pounds of pressure per square inch to break. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the iron palm. This has been a much discussed in articles, but little known type of training. Mainly because most of the masters that used to train in it no longer use the iron palm, or they have died away. And it's becoming slowly a lost art of the Chinese martial arts. I have been training in it for over 35 years. There are many various stages of training in the Chinese martial arts. The iron palm is but one segmented part of it. The whole purpose of training in the iron palm is to do primarily one thing. That is to make you capable of striking another human being with such force that only one blow is needed to do the damage that would be necessary to totally incapacitate your opponent. Many people have advertised iron palm. The type of medicines they use are really probably one of the most important in the entire aspect of the training. What you see here is a bag filled with iron pellets. There's approximately 75 pounds of them in this bag. The bag is approximately 12 inches by 12 inches. The height of the bag is determined by the height of the individual that is using the bag for practicing purposes. What I'm going to run you through now is exactly every step of the way in which to fit your hand, when to put the medicine on, how much medicine to use and how many times you're going to strike the bag. First of all, the first thing, and it's as important as any other part of it, is you begin the training with a short meditation. The meditation is nothing but running the chi down the front, up the back, down the front, and up the back, and concentrating on that and that alone. The position that you hold in this meditative position and standing in front of the bag, holding your hands thus, let them rest or relax just below the belly button on your body. Put your tongue on the roof of your mouth lightly. Close your eyes so they're approximately one quarter of the way open and start your breathing. Inhaling as it comes up the back, Exhaling as it goes down the front. You will do this for approximately five to six minutes. At the end of that time, you then open your eyes and we'll go to the next step. The next step is the use of the iron palm medicine itself. The medicine that we will sell and make available to the people that want to train in the iron palm are made up of anywhere from 16 to 24 different herbs. Most of these herbs come from mainland China. Very few of them are cheap. Most of them are expensive. I get my herbs through a teacher who is on mainland China. He's not necessarily a hand training type teacher, but he's the one who obtains the herbs, sends them to Hong Kong, and 
there, they are then brought into the United States. Now to keep the general public or anybody else or any other style from finding out what the formula is that we use in the iron palm, this is we use a standard method. I get the herbs from three different herb stores. They are sent to three different herb stores. Other than the man that gathers the herbs for me, no one else besides myself knows what is actually in this formula. So I order them in three separate places. They are then sent to me. I, in turn, take the raw herbs and put them in a food processor to grind them up, not in a powder so they cannot be too readily identified or weighed. This is solely for the purpose of maintaining the secrecy of that formula. When you rub the medicine on, you're rubbing it all over your hand. Back, around the wrist, fingertips, everywhere. You continue rubbing until all the medicine is inside the hand or has been absorbed and your hand is perfectly dry. Once it's done that, then we will start the actual striking of the bag. There are basically four ways that you hit. We will show you a couple of extra ones and you can even add on your own, depending upon the style of fighting that you're in and what would seem more applicable to you personally or to your style. First, we have already done the first step. We have meditated. Secondly, we have put the hand medicine on. Next, we are going to do the first of the, one, of the four types of basic stripes. The blow starts from here, right in front of your own forehead. Your arm is relaxed. You will then drop it and tense at the last instant, and at that time, you will exhale. So as you raise your arm, inhale, exhale on impact. You're striking with the palm. Again, inhale, exhale on impact, not on the way down. Just prior to impact, let the air escape. Right? You're learning to bring that energy up and out and through the hand. The medicine that we use helps bring the chi to the hand itself, not just protect it, like most of the medicines that are on the market today. You will strike this way ten times. Then each week thereafter, you will add ten until you reach fifty strikes. So that on the first week, 10 times. The second week, 20 times. The third, 40. Third, 30, and so on. The next strike you use will be the back of the hand. This is a part of the hand that you must be extremely careful of. You will notice on your own hand there was very little, if any, protection between the skin and the bones themselves. You will build up a pad eventually, but you must do it extremely slowly. You will start in the same manner up here, do the breathing exactly the same, but when you come down, just hit lightly. Make sure that the wrist never touches. At any time that you strike, the wrist always stays away from that bag. This is the place you're going to get injured. It's in this area here. The palm, it's impossible to strike it. With the back of the hand, if you would come level, you can strike it. So always leave it on angle. It will be impossible for you to strike it. You will do this method of striking 10 times. Right after striking with a palm. Now, you are halfway through the four basic methods that you're going to strike. Again, pick up the medicine. Put it on your hand. Deliberately. Rub it in. Good. Even though you're only striking ten times each way, you'll still do it. When you're 
striking 30, you'll do it. 40, 50, you'll still do it. When you're halfway through your program, put medicine on your hand. The third strike is the knife edge. The knife edge again, you're making sure that you stay away from the wrist. It's very easy not to get it because your hand should be on a slight angle. You will strike the same way. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Be relaxed all the way until the last instant. Then you tighten your hand at the same time as you exhale. It is important anytime you are hitting a bag or striking or using your hand for any type of training that you use medicine. Again, I want to warn you again, do not strike in the wrist area. Stay away from it. You will strike with the edge of the hand 10 times the first week and graduate up to where you are doing 50. The last strike, instead of bringing our hand all the way up to the forehead, you will hold it right here, about even with your nose, and you're going to use a palm strike. This makes it shorter. You will inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Okay? Eventually, you will build up a pocket as you're striking. As it starts to get too deep, shake your bag, make sure that it's leveled out when you're going through your hitting process. These are the four basic methods of striking. After you've been striking your bag for approximately four to six months, if you're in the Eagle Claw system or any of the other systems that you use your fingertips for striking, you can also strike with your fingertips. These are going to be extremely tender, so when you're putting the medicine on, make sure that you're rubbing it in very well. Come up the same way and come down. The hand's coming down similar to a tiger claw and all the fingers striking at the same time. You will hit the same amount of times, 10 times, and then build it up to 50. So if you're hitting five ways, now you're building up to where you're hitting 250 times. This will be done in the first year, twice a day. After that, you can use it once a day. When you feel your hand has reached a particular level of expertise, then you can hit it once or twice a week, if that's what you want. It's like a knife that builds an edge on it. When you feel it's getting a little dull, sharpen it by striking. I hit my hand every day for almost 27 years. Rather, this made a lot of difference in my capability of striking objects. I don't know. The original program calls for a one year, twice a day, the second year, once a day, and once a day thereafter, as long as you wish to strike. Now, during the time that you are striking, some people use short chopping motions where they block a blow and then strike instantly. You can use this also, doing the same thing. Inhale, exhale. strike with the same hand that you have blocked with. As I said in the beginning, your own ideas, your own style are what's going to tell you the extra ways or the other ways that you wish to strike the bag. Use your own imagination. Use what you feel is necessary for you. If you want to develop the knuckles, do the same thing. Strike the bag with the knuckles. Punching downwards. We don't develop the knuckles because the open hand is far more effective in striking. It's faster than a closed hand. So everybody in the beginning of their training learns how to punch and you're using your knuckles. The further advanced you get, the less you use a punch and you go to open hand striking. All right, now we have completed all the ways that we're going to strike. Again, at the completion, put the medicine up here. Now, we're going to do a breathing 
you're going to inhale tense, completely tight, and exhale all the air out and push it down and out of your body and make it sound just like this. medicine down. Then we'll go to the next stage. You will take your wrists, leaving them limp, and shake your fingers. Just like this for approximately 30 seconds.
When you get the medicine, it must set up in a glass container filled with any type of 80 proof alcohol. Uh, do not use gin or scotch, but anything else for at least six to eight weeks. Once it's done that, then pour out of your big jar into a smaller one, into a smaller one, so that the original jar can be kept sealed and you're using out of a small one. Do not attempt to break blocks during the initial part of your training. When you have approximately one year of training in, where you're striking twice a day, then start breaking blocks. Before that time, I do not recommend it. Everybody is eager to break. Breaking is not a part of the martial arts. It is nothing but a tool of an instructor to present to a student how hard a particular blow can land on another human being. I realize that in, in demonstrations to the general public, all they're interested in is seeing break. This is, to them, is what the martial arts is all about. It's fine to demonstrate. Do not over-demonstrate. Do it several times a year, five or six times a year, that's it. To continually break and break and break and break, you are going to injure yourself eventually. And I don't know whether you can come back out of it. The best thing to do is use your head. When you're breaking, always break down. Break the same way that you have been striking your bag. If you want, use spacers at the beginning. Small ones, not the large ones that are used by most karate schools. Something maybe an eighth of an inch, maybe a little bit bigger. And try breaking. Once you get up to eight, you can break spaced. Then start taking one of the spacers out. So that the top two are solid. Then eventually the next one out and the next one out. And go down as far as you can go so you can break eight solid. To break eight solid, like I explained to you at the beginning, will take you over 6,000 pounds of pressure per square inch striking power. The largest bone in the human body can only withstand a thousand pounds of force. So you can hit with a tremendous amount of power. This hand is used for fighting, it's used for demonstrations, it's used to protect yourself. Don't abuse it. If you have any questions during your training, Feel free to write the address that you get your medicine from. We will answer any and all questions that you send to us. If you're having any type of trouble whatsoever, we will figure out what the problem is and we'll solve it for you. On a very rare occasion, we have seen some people that are allergic to alcohol. And when they're rubbing the medicine on, the alcohol caused a rash. Most of them got over it can't get over it, then you are really allergic to alcohol. In the 35 years that I've been teaching this, I would say that I've only ran into two students that have ever had this kind of problem, and out of the two, one of them completely overcame it. The other one took quite a long time. We just kept nursing him along. We finally completed it. Again, use your head when you're using this hand. You are married once you have attained this hand. Do not spank your child. Do not hit your wife. Be careful what you're doing when you use that hand. You can create a tremendous amount of injury. Again, I'll tell you once more, if you have any problems at all, contact us immediately and we will take care and do best we can to solve your individual problems. I thank you.
Thank you, Yvette. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We have called this special meeting this evening for one very simple reason. A number of you had the opportunity to preview Master Coin's take on the Iron Ball training program. Uh, we showed that last week after several revisions uh, that he did at his school, Hook Chun. And a number of questions were asked of me by the group that we had in for that evening. Uh, some of the questions seemed to suggest that there was some conflict or disagreement between the way Iron Palm was done there by Master Chukoyan and the way it's done here at Green Dragon. Uh, I assure you that nothing could be further from the truth. And rather than deal with the questions that came up on an individual basis, one by one over the next couple of three or four weeks, I decided to do what we usually do here at Green Dragon and convene a meeting of the interested parties, those that have the greatest concern about the Iron Palm issue, and take care of all of the questions all at one time. So what we have here is, of course, advanced students who have been doing Iron Palm for a number of years and have had some tremendous, tremendous benefits and power increases as a result. We have a group of you people here who have just started your Iron Palm. We have a group of you who have your medicine cooking, who have not actually begun training on the bag as yet. And then finally, we have a group of you who have expressed strong interest in palm training as soon as I can acquire the herbs for you or otherwise authorize it. That generally breaks down the categories we have in here this evening. I don't know, uh, short of convening the entire school, uh, anybody else that would benefit from a meeting of this kind, most of our beginners and most of our university club people are not even ready to digest information like this as yet. Uh, the difference is that you people seem to detect who previewed Master Shikoyan's take were really not differences at all, let alone conflict. Uh, <clears throat> there is a small difference in several areas of operating philosophy between Ho Chun and Green Dragon, even though we have been allied as sister schools now for many, many years. Master Shikoyan and I, of course, go back over 25 years. Uh, what you have uh, detected in looking at that tape was essentially one thing. He does at his school what is called the nine-step short program, and here we do what we call the 12-step long program. The nine separate steps that he goes through on that tape, which you people, most of you saw last week, are the same nine steps that we go through, but we have three steps making a total of 12 that precede his nine. Now the question of course immediately arises, are they critical to the program? And the answer to that quite simply is no. If they were critical to the program, then he would have included them on the tape. When you are dealing with Iron Paul, there is really only one absolutely essential one absolutely indispensable prerequisite, and that is that you have legitimate iron palm herbs, legitimate medicine, a genuine formula to use. And as all of you know, and we need to get into this this evening, we have the strongest formula in existence. We have the original Northern Sholin formula with the additional three herbs added by Grandmaster Chang some years ago that have enhanced the power development capabilities of that formula to a considerable extent. So I think what we could do is perhaps just go through the mechanics of Iron Palm for you as it exists at Green Dragon. Go through the 12 steps, and of course the nine, the last nine of those 12 would just be repetitious. They'll be what Master Shikoyan has on that tape. Uh, we are videotaping this this evening, so as a result we may even tack this meeting on to the end of his tape, just as an additional information base for Green Dragon people that are in our extension family doing instructional videotapes. For whatever additional knowledge or insight or edification, uh, what we cover this evening may give them as a result of combining the two things together. 
One of the reasons I think that you have a short program emphasized there and a long program emphasized here is the same thing that relates to a small difference we have in operating philosophy. Uh, Master Shikoyan has a, an emphasis in his school of acquiring big, strong people. They are, in essence, a reflection of himself. Master Shikoyan is six foot one, six foot two. His body weight ranges between 220 and 235 pounds, depending on what kind of training he's currently undergoing. He is a big, powerful man. Take it from me, I've been hit by him on a number of occasions, and I can readily attest to uh, the kind of power this man can generate. When you saw the tape open up with the side chop on the eight freestanding blocks, there are very few people, if any, in the United States who can duplicate that, especially when you consider the short route through which his hand travels before he even makes contact with the block. That's incredible breaking. It requires immaculate timing and speed, in addition, of course, to the power injection. Very difficult to do, which is why we opened the tape with that shot of that style of break. <clears throat> but because he is a big, powerful man, he tends to stress very basic fighting techniques, the development of a tremendous amount of strength and power in big people. What we have become somewhat famous for here at Green Dragon is in some ways just the reverse of that. We have been able over the years to take small people, men of small size, small stature, small bones, light in body weight, 140, 50, 60, 70 pounds. Not to mention, of course, the female members of our staff who have been trained in all these same programs. We've taken little people and made them incredibly strong. Now, of course, the old weightlifter's argument about who is the stronger, the man who lifts the most or the man who lifts the most pound for pound. You might try to make that argument here, but it does not apply. The man who lifts the most is the stronger man, and a good big man, highly trained, is better than a good little man, highly trained any time. And we've always acknowledged that. Nevertheless, I take a, a certain element of, uh, I wouldn't say pride, sense of accomplishment perhaps, that we've been able to take small people and make them incredibly powerful. We have people here breaking six and seven blocks, two inch blocks, downward strike with no separators between the blocks who weigh less than 138 pounds. Scott here is one of those. Uh, <clears throat> that is excellent, excellent breaking when you have no mass to bring to the situation. And of course, it's a very eloquent testimony to the effectiveness of iron palm training in that it's internal power that is doing this. It's obviously not size, it's not mass. All right. So I think that over there they adhere to the nine step short program because this is the kind of thing they emphasize. Over here, we don't emphasize just a few things into which great strength is put. Over here, of course, we take the classical approach and do literally thousands of things. We like people over here to be enamored of great variety in their training, which we think maintains interest and enthusiasm for the long term. It also, I think, can develop skills and abilities that otherwise you may not acquire. Now, with all of this being said, let's look at some of the mechanics before we look at the 12 steps in our program. All right, we have out here a typical bag of steel shot. And what we do is we take 16 ounce heavy cannons, always white, never dyed. You don't want color dyed blending with your medicine and coming back up into your palm. Should be white, clean canvas. 14 ounce will suffice, but 16 ounce is better. It's about as heavy as you can get here in the greater Akron, Ohio metropolitan area. We do not use lead shot for any number of reasons. It has been done on occasion in some schools, and it will produce some success. But there are two very definite drawbacks to it. 
<clears throat> the chief one is the fact that the lead BBs will compress over time. Lead is very malleable, as you know. And as you hit this, uh, over time, you will start to compress those BBs down so that they'll become almost a solid mass. You won't have any return shock action into the ball, and of course you will be very limited in your results as a consequence of that. Likewise, of course, some people have said secondarily that there is a risk of lead poisoning. Iron palm solution, as you know, is extremely strong. That's why it's stored in glass bottles. If we store it in plastic, it dissolves the plastic. All right, so there's every, every chance that you could get some lead dissolving in the solution that stays in the bag because, as you'll notice from the distilleration on the bag here, the place where the palm strikes are made the most often, which is dead center on the bag, is highly discolored. The whole bag has begun to take the coloration of the medicine. This used to be pure white. And if you ever open one of these things up, you'll find on the inside powdered medicine after it has been struck for a number of years. We usually go in here and collect the powder out of there, put it back in the solution because it can be used as an excellent Dajjal type or heavy duty bruise medicine. Uh, these iron ball herbs that we get are so powerful that there is always some power uh, latent in the herbs. It never goes away completely. It just loses its ability to draw chi to the palm, which it can only do when it's fresh. So we make a bag of 16-ounce white canvas. We sew it with heavy-duty nylon thread all the way around, leaving one small hole about an inch long. And we screw a funnel into that hole, fill the bag with BBs until it's 80% filled. You never fill it up so that it is completely tight. You want the bag to be such that when you hit it, you can compress the bag. It should not be like hitting a solid block of steel. So you fill it approximately 80% full, sew up that last inch of seam, and you're ready to go. Now, what do you use for a stand? And our bags, by the way, as we do them, I make it 12 by 14 inches sewn when it's empty. A foot square, I think, is what Master Shikoyan uses. That makes absolutely no difference at all to anything. As long as there is an ample square area of bag underneath this palm when it comes down to strike, you're in good shape. Uh, we've always used 12 by 14. It just seems to work out very well that way. We use three concrete building blocks, solids, as a support base for the average student. We do this essentially for two reasons. The base underneath the bag should be completely immobile. It shouldn't move. There should be no give to it. You shouldn't set a bag on your dining room table or on a chair or something of this nature. We use three 8 by 8 by 16 solid, no holes, I used to use holes and I began to collapse the blocks underneath my bag after a while. They would just crack and give way under the, under the beating. So these are solid all the way through. <clears throat> there should be no give, so don't set it on anything that's going to have any give to it whatsoever. And the second reason we use this is because it is accepted in almost all iron palm training programs that the best place to position the bag relative to your body is about halfway up the thigh, dividing the thigh evenly between the knee and the hip. So the surface of the bag, as you can see here, approximates on me that exact position. Now that is when you're standing in your basic Mabur horse stance, which is the position that you are in when you strike the bag. Now I notice some of you uh, asked the question, after viewing Master Shikoyan's tape, did it not seem as though his bag was placed very high, and was he not high up in the stands? Uh, the answer to that is yes, but at his level, that really makes no difference. And I doubt very much that it makes too much difference, even to a beginning iron palm student. We know from research that was done here that we don't have time to get into this evening with biofeedback devices, 
that for some peculiar reason that the Chinese have probably understood for 2,000 years without being able to explain it, that maximum power generation can come right about in this area, staying on the center line, in the horse stance, which is about 70 to 75 percent of your normal height. You can hit harder on the iron palms, going from here with a slight dip in the stance on contact, than you can by setting your bag up too high. Maximum power generating capability occurs when you have the surface of this bag at a height that would divide your thighs evenly when you are standing in a horse stance. Now, is that understood? All right. So much for bag construction, so much for bag placement. Uh, we acquire steel shot here to fill the bags uh, from an industrial supply outlet in Cleveland, Ohio. The BBs do not have to be of uniform size. They do have to be round. The diameters can differ in size. Uh, we had a sample over here in the lounge area for all of you to see when you came in. Those of you that are uh, about to start the program and have not acquired any of your materials yet, you want to take a look at those if you didn't. They're in the cup over here. Uh, you can have anything ranging in size from BB size, literal BB size, the kind of BBs you use in a BB gun, which are copper or brass, so they're not at all suitable for iron palm training, so don't use them. But from that size on down to about half of that size is the size of steel shot you want to get. And it can be all mixed. Now the idea is, of course, that when you hit this bag, you want to return shock action coming back up into your palm. And believe me, uh, in the incipient stages of training, you'll feel that with no problem. Okay, it's very important for developing power. It's very important for hardening the bones of the hand that have this return shock action coming up in there. Okay? When you begin your training, formal training, you'll go through 12 steps, all of which are quite simple. The longest step, of course, being right in the middle, striking of the bag. Now, I won't do these in great detail because Master Shacoin has done an adequate job covering it on the tape that you people saw. And of course, that tape's available for you to watch here on our video equipment over here anytime you wish. Uh, so I'll hit those lightly. What I will do is take the first three steps that he felt were unnecessary to put on the tape and explain those two. We start the program, of course, with the push against heaven, push against earth exercise, or simplistically speaking, what some of you know as the double palms. All right? Standing at attention with the knees slightly bent, not locked. You people do this exercise in your opening warm ups to harden the back of the forearms, and as a consequence, in so doing, tension to keep the hands at 90 degrees and keep the bridge part of the forearm under great stress. Great strain is what is emphasized, all right? Now you still breathe hypogastrically, you still breathe diaphragmatically, you still exhale on the push away and inhale on the retraction, but you're still thinking in terms of isotonics, heavy tension, hitting one muscle group against the other as the arms are straightening. What you really want to emphasize in your iron palm program, here in step one, starting with this exercise, is the breathing. You will still keep the hands at 90 degrees at the wrists. You will still keep a mild tension on the back of the forearms, wrist, and back of the hand, fingers extended and joined. But in your mind's eye, all concentration will go on long, soft, even, rhythmic, extended inhales and exhales. You have four sets of 10 repetitions each, as you all know. Starting with double down, pushing away, exhaling, belly breathing, no chest breathing, diaphragm moving up and down, no chest moving in and out. You get a massage on the internal organs this way, you stimulate the circulation, but more importantly than anything else, for iron palm, which is an internal program, it begins to get the chi moving in the area of the Dajian here, 
three finger widths below your own navel. It begins to activate this area. That's what the breathing does. The palm exercise doesn't do a thing if it's done without the proper breathing. You have four sets. You do 10 repetitions of double down at about this speed, okay? You inhale before you start, start right at the solar plexus, exhaling as you go down, try to exhale the entire way, time to the movement. When you get to the bottom, inhale all the way up to the solar plexus, exhale all the way down, inhale all the way up, exhale all the way down at about this speed, keeping these hands here at 90 degrees to the wrist. So you will entail some pain here, but forget the externals and concentrate on the breathing. You'll do 10 up and down. You'll do 10 overhead, exhaling as you push away, inhaling as you bring it back. Then you'll split. Right will be up, left will be down, left will start at the solar plexus, right will start at the forehead. Both hands will remain on the center line, one directly above the other. Very important. Exhaling on the push away, inhaling on the retraction, exhaling on the push away at about this speed, inhaling on the retraction, and then of course reverse them, the right at the solar plexus, the left at the forehead, and do your final 10 repetitions, exhaling as you push, inhaling as you set up again, exhaling as you push, one directly over the other on the center line. That is step one. That gives you 40 total repetitions. 10 repetitions each way. Double down, double up, right left split with the right high, right left split with the left high. You go right from that to what we call seven point breathing. This is something that is extremely important in a variety of Chinese styles and in a variety of exercises, especially where internal considerations are made. Now, seven-point breathing is kind of hard for some people to get a handle on. Uh, we call it running the seven points. We do it in the intellectual fist or Singi Chuan stance because this is a very uh, common exercise for those people. And in so doing, you just assume a shoulder-width stance with your toes slightly out. Now, I know we always emphasize toes in here for balance. Just assume a shoulder width stance, toes slightly out. Take the hands and form a circle here. Circle looks like this. Nice and big around with the hands, all three of the main joints, shoulders, elbows, and wrists relaxed, drooping. Extremely important. All of you know that the chi has difficulty getting past joint areas. And there's the three main joints before chi can get to the palms. So anytime you're doing an internal exercise of any kind where the emphasis is on breathing, always make sure the joints are relaxed. The tighter or the more tension you have on the joint areas, the more restrictive it's going to be to the flow of the chi. Now when you stand in that stance, shoulder width, toes slightly out, hands in this position, you want the tongue on the roof of the mouth, Eyes half closed if you can maintain that comfortably. A lot of people can't. If you cannot maintain an eyes half closed position, then close the eyes completely, but don't squeeze them tight. Breathe, of course, through your nose. You will inhale as you go up through the seven points in your mind's eye now, and you will exhale as you go down through the seven points. Now, what is seven point breathing? Step two in Iron Palm. See, this is all setting you up to pull chi to your palms for whatever reason. To do good in the sense of massage or injuries, uh, to do damage if necessary in your own self-defense. The first spot is a spot which is right between the rectal opening and the base of the scrotal sac in the male. So it's up under here in the groin area, where the legs come together, exactly halfway between the rectal opening, anal opening, 
in the base of the scrotal sac. Now, how will you know where that is? You can feel for that spot. It is a master point for acupuncture. It is a point at which to hurt somebody severely in kicking them. Uh, death can result if the blow is hard enough. You can feel for that spot, and you'll know it when you feel it. It is that sensitive. All right, in seven point breathing, that's point one. Point two is a spot between the pubic bone and the navel. Now, it's not halfway. Top of the pubic bone is here. Navel is here. What this is, of course, is the dongan, and this will be three fingers width. Take three fingers like this. Put the top finger on the navel. The dantian will be below the third finger. Now the dantian is about the size of a quarter in terms of area. So you don't have to have a tremendous amount of accuracy when you're considering this point. Point three is the navel itself. Point four is the area of your solar plexus right below the breastbone sort of up and in at that point. It's at the bottom end of the breastbone or sternum, exactly one halfway between the nipples on the chest. Only down here. Your fifth area is the pit of the neck, where you're always told to strike. It's supposed to be such a, a, a vital area. The sixth is the spot right between your eyes. And the seventh is a point at the top of your head, which would bisect the line. It's on the center line, but it would bisect the line drawn up from both ears. There is the seven master points for seven-point breathing. Now, you people that have the legs over exercise laying on your back with the toe grab, the leg strengthening, and the two uh, hypogastric breaths at that point, while doing the seven point breathing, you, you say it's such a hard uh, exercise to do. You're doing the same, that's from the advanced body, yes. You're doing the same thing there that you're doing here. Same thing. All right, so what you want to do is take your shoulder width stance, toes slightly out, make your circle here, hands drooping, wrists relaxed, elbows relaxed, shoulders relaxed, Eyes closed, tongue on the roof of the mouth, breathing through the nose only. All right? And you're going to inhale as you come up. Now you say, wait a minute. My lungs are in my thoracic cavity here. My lungs don't extend down here to a point between my anal opening and scrotal sac. Well, <laughs> you needn't tell me that. This is, of course, a visualization. This is a method for concentration. This is something that you do in the figuratively speaking mind of your eye. You direct in your mind's eye, you try to picture, you try to feel the breath beginning at point one down there. And as you start to inhale, of course the diaphragm is going down, you will get some feeling all throughout the visceral cavity here especially when you get good at this. You'll notice some very definite, for example, warming effects. Some people even go so far as to get what they would classify as hot flashes from this. If you do, that's an excellent sign that you've got a lot of chi moving around there that you're going to be able to distribute, draw on, pull to the hand. As you inhale, you envision your breath starting at point one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven. Exhaling down, one, very slowly. Two, through the nose. Three, four, five, six, and seven. Inhaling, it comes up. Exhaling, it goes down. You're standing like this the whole time, seeing these points and trying to feel the breath passing these points eight times. Up and down is one. Up and down again is two. Up and down again is three. So you have eight of those done, and you 
you've done step two. Now you're going to feel a very definite warming effect in the body by this time, having done your first step, your palm exercise, 40 repetitions, having done the seven point breathing up and down eight times. It's setting you up for your iron palm program. And we regard it as quite important. And if you're started in a condition where you weren't relaxed when you began, this has a tremendous tendency to relax you, uh, very much indeed, which is a real good thing. We have, at this point now, the internal exercise number one as our third step. And then, of course, when we go to step four, we'll pick up Master Shikoyan's first step. Are we clear on this? No problem, okay? We're adding two, see? The two are not in conflict anywhere. There are no contradictions. We just do three extra things here uh, that a master who, uh, Master Shikoyan and I had in common. He trained with a famous Trolley Foot master and Southern Five Family master here in Ohio for 20 some years. I trained with the same master for 14 years. And a lot of the iron ball training uh, knowledge that we got, we both got together from this one man, although Master Shikoyan had been trained in a form of palm even before that, and I had not been. And that particular master, uh, of whom I speak, thought these three exercises were important to add to the palm program, and as a result, I teach them to my students. Let me emphasize once again, it has never held anybody back in Master Shikoyan's school by not doing these. They have attained some remarkable uh, power development over there. All right? So we go to internal exercise number one. And internal exercise number one also has eight repetitions. This is a hand style of uh, exercise, which is basically done in concert with breathing and hand movement, where the concentration is split between the two. Uh, this is hard for some people to do in the beginning, but we take a shoulder width stance once again. Notice that we're not locked into hard horse stances for these internal exercises. Let us do the hand motion first. The breathing uh, co coordinates with it very well and very easily. We'll be raising the hands in this fashion, almost like the opening step in Tai Chi. Then we throw them over like this, completely relaxed. We extend them up and bring them all the way down the outside in a big circle. 180 degrees to the front of the body where we begin again. Now the essence of this is first, relaxation. Second, proper hypogastric breathing, belly breathing. The thing you people should be doing all of the time in everything that you do. So-called hard style or soft makes no difference. And then thirdly, concentration. Think about the palm throughout the whole thing here. And you'll find that the palms will rapidly feel as though they're getting heavy. And when you get to the place where you flip these over like this, you'll feel like there's a weight pressing down here. When you begin to get that feeling after the first couple of weeks, be assured you are making some progress already. The breathing is simple. Inhaling as the hands are raised, at about this speed, exhaling as they turn over, inhaling as they are pushed to the ceiling, exhaling as they come all the way down. Here is your speed. Inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. Eight repetitions for that one. Now there are the three preliminary exercises that we do that give us a total of 12 steps. 
At this point, with step four, we pick up with step one in Master Shikoyan's program. It's just that simple. And almost everything that you people sensed about differences that you thought you saw really stem from that. Right? At this point, we have the opening meditation with the interlocked palms placed over the Dan Tien, which he describes quite adequately. There's no point in our going into that. And you, <coughs> of course, apply uh, your medicine for the first time, the first of three times, right after that. And then you do the first half of your bag striking technique. Now here some of you ask about the slight dip in the stance, which is correlated with bag height, which you again saw as a difference between what he demonstrated and what I teach you. That is nothing to be concerned about whatsoever. Uh, this is the way that I was taught. I will emphasize to you once again, any kind of result in terms of power augmentation that anybody could rationally expect, his students have achieved. And then some. Uh, there are some breaking uh, demonstrations that we have done in, in concert with the uh, Ho-Chun senior people where uh, they've done some magnificent things in terms of demonstrating power development out of their iron palm training. <clears throat> there isn't very much vertical movement done, however, uh, in their demonstration. We do a little. We take a basic horse stance, bag at this height, splitting the thigh. Everything else is the same. Hand is relaxed. Bag is hit with a slapping motion, not a hitting motion. And he is not hitting hard. The hand is actually uh, thrown to the bag in the same sense as you would throw a baseball or a football and then let it go. The only difference being is that the arm is relaxed completely without tension right up to the moment that the hand strikes the bag and then it's tensed, which allows the power to jump from the pawl into the body of the person or, in this case, into the bag. The bag, of course, responding by picking up that in a, in a resonant fashion and shooting it right back into your hand. All right, it does not matter whether you hit ball and then back of the hand and then chop and then the shorter throw ball, just as he described it, whether you do them like that <coughs> Excuse me. Or whether you do all ten palms in a row at about this speed, and then all ten back of the hand, and then all ten chops, and then all ten of the different style of palm strike. It doesn't matter. You can do it either way, rotating through, palm, back of the hand, chop different palm, or you can do all 10 palm, all 10 back of the hand, all 10 chop, all 10 of the shorter throw palm. Is that clear? <clears throat> Somebody asked a question about what is the difference between the first palm and the last? The first one has more of a slapping motion. The fourth one, the second palm, but the fourth hit, which is shorter throw taken from in here as opposed to over the head, has more of a pressing motion to it than a slapping motion. All right? Uh, here again, if you did them exactly the same, I seriously doubt, uh, we'll take care of that in a minute, I seriously doubt that there would be any difference in power augmentation. All right? Halfway through your routine, whether you do it one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, that for 10 repetitions each surface, or whether you do all 10 repetitions in palm, all 10 in back of the hand, all 10 in knife edge, and so forth, like that, halfway through, you reapply the medicine, just as Master Shakoyan said. That makes for your second med medicinal application. 
in your program. All right? You'll go then to striking your bag for the second half of your program. Then you will go to the internal exercise. Now, your application of medicine number one was step five. Striking the bag for the first half of your repetitions was six. Application of medicine number two, second time you did it, was number seven in terms of steps. Striking the bag for the second half of your program was number eight. And then the internal exercise that Master Shikoyan demonstrated with a very audible exhale through the mouth as you're going down from here is number nine. Step number nine. Your vigorous knee row for about two minutes is what we do it. Uh, there really is no limitation. You can just stay in behind your bag here and do the knee row very vigorously for as long as you like. You do it until the palms are very, very hot. It also stimulates circulation in the knee joints because now you have been standing in your stance for a while. Uh, that won't be a very long time when you're only doing 10 repetitions on each of the four surfaces. But when you get up to 50, so that you're doing 200 strikes on the bag twice a day, then of course you're building up a little bit of stance time. So it's nice to uh, stimulate circulation in the area of the knee joint. You don't do it for that reason, of course, that's just a side benefit. You go until the palms are very, very hot. Very, very hot indeed. And then step number 11, you have your third application of medicine. And I want to reinforce what Master Shikoyan said on that tape. Use your medicine liberally. Use a lot of it. There is no way to injure yourself or disfigure yourself in this program as long as you coat those hands with that medicine three times throughout the course of the program. The, the stuff is fantastic. None of this uh, three or four little drops in the palm and then rub your hands together like this in order to save it for posterity. What we will give you, that whole uh, gallon-sized baggie filled with herbs makes enough medicine to last you three to five years. And that's using it liberally because it'll make three to five gallons of strong formula. There is no need to try to conserve it. And at the end of the three to five year period, power development begins to taper off anyway. You can continue to improve but the gains will not come like they come the first three years. And it's at that point then that some of you will want to jump to advanced hand training, so-called poison hand, so-called black hand. A question came up, by the way, what is the difference between the basic iron pole where we start and the advanced hand? And I'll deal with that in just a second. There's your 11 steps. Number 12 is the hand shaking. And then stand in doing your palms out meditation, as Master Shikoyan demonstrated, doing it till you feel heat, doing it till you feel the pulse in the hands. And then and there could be a step 13, but we don't regard it as a step. Just walk around and throw the hands like this for four or five minutes. Now, why do you want to do that? Well, it's relaxing. It restores circulation to the legs. But I'll tell you this, when you get to the point in your iron palm training where you do this and you feel like you've got a lead or a steel glove covering both hands, when those hands feel like they're made out of marble while you're swinging like this, like you've got a real serious weight on the end of your arms, when you get to that point, you're making some good, substantial progress. Feeling of heat in the hands and heaviness to the hands is one of the surest signs that you're pulling the chi through the three primary gates, shoulder, elbow, and wrist, and out into the palms. All right, one final question before I deal with the differences between basic palm and advanced palm training. Someone asked about fingers, training the fingertips and training the knuckles. Uh, they advocated at Ho-Chan, uh, Master Shikoyan does, and 
You have never heard me advocate it here. Uh, I do not, not advocate. We were told originally by the master who gave us our basic poem that it would take many, many, many years because there are so many joints in the fingers to pull chi through the fingers that almost no one ever attains that capability. So re <clears throat> reasonably, all you're going to do is toughen the end of the fingers if you strike the bag in fingertip strikes. Uh, <clears throat> so for that reason, I don't do it. And the same is true for knuckles. All right, so that answers that question. I think we've covered just about all the questions that you people have had. Uh, they center once again for the third time now, basically on the fact that we do the three preliminary exercises, giving us 12 total steps here, over and against the shorter version, leaving off the initial three that Master Shikoyan demonstrated uh, on his tape. And for those people that will be doing our instructional videotape, if I include this meeting with you people on the end of his, then you have the whole ball of wax and you know everything. And there is no problem. Now, for the differences to conclude this this evening, uh, then we'll shut the camera off and have open question and answer here. To conclude this, we'll deal with the differences between basic iron palm and advanced palm, and that's really very simple. Uh, we don't need to get into the mechanics because most of you people are years away from advanced hand training. The chief manifestation is this. In basic iron palm, you still have to have hard contact with your opponent or with the object. And the amount of internal power that you can inject into a person's body is not strictly controllable. It is partially controllable, but not wholly so. If we could talk in terms of percentages, which is kind of foolish, but just as an illustration, if we knew what 100% of our power was, and we only wanted to use 30% of it, you can't do that in basic iron ball. You're allowed to go in and try to use 30% of it and shoot 60% instead. And this is why we have to give you the admonition of being careful. If you're an instructor and you're dealing with your students, you have to be careful how you hit them. If you're a parent, you have to be very careful when spanking children. Uh, the old joke about slapping your buddy on the back and doing him some serious damage, uh, while that sounds humorous, nevertheless, has an element of truth to it. It isn't strictly controllable. So you have a real weapon here that you don't have maximum control over. When you get to advanced hand training, the reverse is true. Now you only need light contact instead of heavy contact to do the damage. And you have a real good feeling and a real good concept for just how much power you want to inject. You can call up a percentage, almost literally. Not only can you do that, but you can determine the degree of penetration. You can hit somebody on the chest here, bruise the skin, do no damage on the inside or the back. You can hit somebody in the exact same spot, leave no bruise on the skin, do all the damage on the inside, no evidence on the back. You can hit somebody at the same spot again, shoot the power all the way through, bruise the skin on the back, not bruise the front, not do any damage on the inside. That's how much control the advanced hand training will give you. What is the big difference between the two? As you would suspect, the medicine. The medicine is much more costly, it's much more complicated to prepare, and it is the medicine that produces these kinds of effects. The mechanical program of training on the bag does change. For example, only the palm and the back of the hand are worked. The 
the knife edge is no longer work. Uh, but that basically is the chief mechanical difference. There's also a striking difference in terms of the routes that are followed. But the medicine, once again, is everything. All right? That covers the 12 steps that we follow here at Green Dragon for pole training. It covers uh, the question you ask about we use stances and we use a little dip with our striking, whereas Master Shikoyim did not. Covers the height of the bag relative to the size of your body. Have it at a height where the top of the bag splits the thighs evenly between the knees and the hips. Covers the question that you asked about the three missing exercises, and we did those for you. Everything else he did in terms of the next nine steps was precisely the way we do it here. All right, do any of you people uh, on the staff have anything you think we ought to add to the end of the tape? Marge? Did you want to say anything about mixing and storage? Mixing and storage, all right. Bring, uh, bring in a bag of herbs and uh, bring in the jug of mix that we already had. Just set it on the lectern here. Thank you. When you people get your herbs, uh, they will not look like this. When the herbs come in from the three sources in the Orient the Master Shikoyan uses, so that no one source knows what the formula is, they come in in the raw form. And in the raw form, of course, we have some 24 ingredients in here. Uh, all different kinds of consistencies, sizes, textures. Uh, we take the raw herbs and we go one step further and grind them with a mixer into a powdered form. We do that intentionally, of course, to disguise the identity of what's in there just a little bit more. But even using the three different sources and grinding these things to powder, uh, if that were not enough, there is one further step which no one could duplicate because nobody knows what to do with it except for Master Chicoin and myself, and that is that there are a number of herbs that go in here which have to be treated with several different processes uh, before they are any good, before they'll be blended in with a formula and do what it is that they are designed to do. Uh, consequently, uh, we can take these, and we used to take these before grinding them up, for our own students here. And we used the pharmaceutical gallon size bottles, dark, brown, or amber colored. Uh, these can be acquired from most pharmacies. You, of course, have to get them in a uh, non-toxic uh, situation, which is to say some, some of the chemicals that come into pharmacies would be highly toxic. Uh, the residue on the inside may not be able to be completely cleaned out. So you want to acquire a bottle, and all you have to do is ask the pharmacist, and they'll usually be kind enough to tell you, cooperative enough. They will give you these free. We used to take all the herbs in the gallon-sized bag, uh, stuff them in the neck of these jars, in the raw form. One of the nice things, of course, about grinding the raw herbs into powder, it's much easier to get it into your master jug. Uh, <clears throat> you could use uh, a plain glass jar once again. If you do that, then store your herbs in a dark place, uh, like a closet or something of this sort. That used to be also with one of the other formulas that we used, that the top of this had to be sealed. We'd have to dip it in a paraffin, liquid paraffin solution, and seal it up. Uh, one of the medicines that we got required a working period or a steeping period of 60 days. Another went up to six months. Uh, <clears throat> with the medicines that we are using now, uh, that is no longer necessary. So mixing and storage is really not a problem of any kind. This stuff, of course, is like liquid gold. Uh, you want to put it in a place where it's very secure and nobody can get their hands on it. 
It is poisonous. Some of the elements uh, in there are poisonous. So obviously don't put it in a place where if you have youngsters around, children, pets, that they can get at your medicine. If nothing else, they may knock it over, break the bottle, and of course you are out in a very priceless treasure. Uh, Yvette, you had a question. Uh, did you want to say something on training uh, one hand over the next training both? Excellent question. Excellent question. There are three schools of thought as to whether or not you ought to train either the right hand or the left hand or both. Uh, we subscribe to one school of thought, but in the Orient there was a division of thinking that said if you're right-handed, train the left hand. Because that, of course, then would bring the left hand up and probably even past what the right hand was capable of doing. There was a second school of thought that said, train both hands. And then a third school, train the strong hand already. In other words, if you're right-handed, train the right hand, and you'll have, in essence, a super hand. It is this third school to which I personally subscribe. I see no reason to train the left hand if you're right-handed. I see no reason to train the right hand if you are left-handed. I think you should train the strongest hand. Uh, Master Shikoyan concurs with me on this. Uh, this is particularly true, once again, for women and men of smaller size. You might as well have a super hand capability on one side. If you train both hands, you divide up the power. The power is spread between the two and neither one will become as strong as a result as what just one hand will become if you train on only one side alone. So we very definitely uh, lean toward right-handed people training only their right hand and left-handed people training only their left hand. But of course the choice in reality is yours. Uh, unfortunately, when I first began, just to share a personal experience with you, I trained both hands for the first 100 days. After the initial 100 days, and I had very, very good results, excellent results. Uh, I came into a situation where, having spent seven years in Shotokan Karate, I had broken my hand three different times, and perhaps one or two times beyond that when I didn't even go to the trouble of having it medically investigated. I uh, displaced all the cartilage in the right wrist so that the carpal bones would not properly seat and the metacarpals in the hand, which had been driven out of the back of the hand up on top of the wrist and had to be reset back in, it was that kind of an injury, uh, disturbed all the structure of the ligaments and the cartilage in this joint area. Uh, when I started my iron palm training first, 22 years ago, I couldn't even turn off a water faucet. I was incapable of doing any kind of twisting motions. I had uh, a little bit of grabbing power. I would say uh, I had lost uh, 50 or 60 percent, at least, of hand capability. Within six months, of training on the bag, 100% of my hand function was restored. And my hand became very, very strong indeed, and to this day uh, has not been similarly re-injured. I take a great deal of precaution. Those of you that have seen me break know that I use a pad on the top of the block uh, so we don't drive these out again. And I don't do that much breaking as a result. Uh, however, this says, of course, a great deal about the power and the potency and the quality of this hand medicine. I don't think anybody will be starting their training with any hand that was worse than mine but when I began within six months' time and ever since. 22 years later, I have never had one other problem with this hand. Again, so those of you that have uh, any second thoughts or misgivings whatsoever about 
injuring yourself or crippling yourself by doing iron palm training, forget it. If you follow the program, as Master Shacoin and I have outlined it for you here, not only will you not be hurt or injured, but if you have any deficiencies in this area of the hand and wrist, uh, those will probably be either cured 100% or the problem will be mitigated a great deal. Uh, anybody who is injured, let me say in closing on iron ball training, is injured usually for one reason and one reason only. And that is they hit the bag too hard. This is an internal program, not an external program. You're not trying to smash your way through this bag and the blocks underneath it. You're trying to bring your internal power up from its residual storage place in this area of the body, through the shoulder, through the gates, out through the palm, into the target. So it isn't necessary for you to hit this bag very hard. The medicine draws the chi from its storage areas to your palm. That is why the herbs are so hard to get. That is why they are expensive. Advanced hand training, which does an even better job of that, is double in price or more. Been a long time since I checked. So when you're behind your bag and you're hitting, remember what I said as we went through the 12 steps. You use a slapping motion on the bag, fluff it up periodically, and just drop the hand in a relaxed fashion, tensing it only on impact. And the way I hit it just then is about all the harder you have to hit this to make the program work. You don't hit this bag like you were trying to break a stack of seven or eight blocks. You just, from overhead position, drop the hand on the bag, whether it's palm, back of the hand, knife edge, or your short throw ball. It's a nice, easy, fairly relaxed, striking method. Now it will sting, lightly. If it stings a great deal, if you find your hand going numb, if you find your hand getting sore the following day, in the initial days when you're hitting the bag, then you are simply hitting the bag too hard. And that is not necessary. You do not, I repeat, do not advance yourself or progress any faster by hitting the bag any harder. That has nothing to do whatsoever with success in the program. It's a nice, medium strength, slapping style method that you use. All right, I think that about takes care of everything that we wanted to cover in this meeting this evening. We will go to questions and answers. If anything comes up in the questions and answers that I feel should have been covered for the purposes of the videotape instruction, we will put it in the Iron Palm handout that will be going out when these people are uh, sent their medicines through the mail, and so they will have access to the information uh, at that time. We'll adjourn now for some tea. If you have questions, do not try to corner me and ask me questions one-on-one. -on -one. Wait until we come back in the group here so that everyone has the benefit of hearing the answer to your question. And we do what we always try to do here at Green Dragon, which is create a mutual frame of reference base uh, for everybody uh, that's involved.